Interdigitated Back Contact, or IBC architectures, are the best performing technology in silicon solar cells. Although perovskite solar cell efficiencies have now surpassed mainstream silicon efficiencies, most of the research has mainly focused on planar heterojunction structures. The number of studies involving IBC devices is still limited, and the proposed architectures are unfeasible for large-scale manufacturing. In this work, we discuss the importance of IBC solar cells as a powerful tool for investigating the fundamental working mechanisms of perovskite materials and show a fabrication protocol for IBC devices that does not involve photolithography and metal evaporation. The most widespread flexible and low-cost deposition technique for perovskite materials is solution processing, which is fast and messy and does not lead to the formation of single crystals, but rather polycrystalline films with very high trap densities. If you look at consolidated device physics and electronics theories, which are taught at undergraduate university courses, you would think that devices based on solution process perovskite could not possibly work. And in fact, solar cells based on gallium arsenide with analogous levels of doping would not work at all. However, perovskites display exceptional optoelectronic properties, which are very similar to those of gallium arsenide, including strong light absorption, non-excitonic behavior, low recombination rates, long carrier lifetimes and diffusion lengths, and photon recycling. In the following section, Professor Richard Friend and Dr. Luis Passos discuss defect tolerance in perovskite materials. We kind of agree that one of the key challenges for any new semiconductor technology is to actually achieve a very good passivation strategy so you can get rid of traps. Do you think there is anything in perovskites that actually allow them to have such a high um, performance? This is probably the absolute core of why the perovskites turn out to be so surprising uh, that in spite of the fact that they have many, many structural and chemical defects, they must have because of the way they're made and the level of impurities that are present. The luminescence, which is the most sensitive test, uh, remains extremely efficient and, and that's unprecedented. Where if you compare other non-crystalline thin film semiconductors, they generally show re really low luminescence yields. So we start with a, a surprise that no matter how you make um, a lead halide perovskite film, it's actually very luminescent. And then of course what's been interesting is that that all sorts of approaches have been taken and now in the literature that show you can improve on it um, by almost certainly uh, passivating, that is removing chem uh, defect states that quench luminescence around the crystallites, maybe in the bulk, but almost certainly it's the surfaces that are mm -hmm. being cleaned up with these approaches. It's just very surprising, it really is different. Well, there are other key aspects, right? Because to achieve a very high luminescence, you certainly benefit from having very low trap densities and low shocker red hole recombination rates, but also having a very strong um, radiative rate, it's beneficial. Do you have any explanation of why the radiative rate is so strong? Well, the, the very uh, um, strong radiative recombination, again, is something which we, we find surprising. The recombination, where electron hole come together again, we know that the kinetics are bimolecular. So the, yes. the rate depends on the electron concentration times uh -huh. the hole concentration. Yeah. Usually that does not give very efficient luminescent mm -hmm. because those collisions don't happen all that quickly, but when they do, they certainly produce photons. Mm -hmm. I think the key is to ratio the radiative recombination processes against everything else going on which can quench the luminescence. Mm -hmm. and it is again surprising that the non radiative channels are relatively unimportant. Yeah. Also because you know this paper that came on, uh, I think it was Nature Photonics a few years ago, about laser cooling. So they actually showed something in the order of 99.8% external luminescence efficiency, and that's really extraordinary. 
and they've shown that on a single crystal. If they have achieved that in a single crystal, doesn't that make you think that perhaps the, the field should move from solution processed materials that are polycrystalline and therefore will most likely have higher defects into actually making devices on single crystals? Wouldn't that be a better approach? Uh, your question was, should we work with single crystals? And yes. the reality is we're not going to be able to if we okay. want to make solar cells because we need to have films of absorbing material that are quite thin of the order of a fraction of a micron. And unless someone finds a remarkably easy way yes. of growing thin crystals um, mm. on in situ, that's not going to happen. And back to the surprise, which is that the performance of polycrystalline materials turns mm. out to be remarkably good and there appear to be methods to um, improve on the uh, original recipes. Of course the other um, the factor that comes into play when we make a device, um, or be it a light emitting diode or a cell to cell, is that the luminescence can easily be quenched at the interface the semiconductor the perovskite makes with the two electrodes for electron and hole management and the current perovskite literature shows that there is still some quenching mm. um, it's easy to suggest why that might be that there are some chemical defects yeah. whatever whatever chemistry there is at that interface um, I don't know with TiO2 for electron extraction it is possible to apparently produce energy states that lie in the gap and there is some quenching. So irrespective of whether it's a single crystal or a thin film which is polycrystalline, and I think a lot of the future efforts are going to be to uh, understand that interfacial chemistry to be able to remove quenching there. We've tended at the moment to concentrate more on the pure material and as the field becomes more developed we will pay more attention to what happens at interfaces. So what do you think it's actually helping to passivate the defects. Is that there is lead on it? Or actually the same effect is observed for different materials? Well, the, the passivation um, appears to be something that can be done with, with, with almost any of the compositions. Um, if one's looking at the sort of fundamental issues, the electronic structure, the band structure, is really determined by the, the lead and the bromide and iodide, and the, uh, the, the third cation probably doesn't do a lot more than yeah. control the lattice parameter. So I wouldn't expect to see a fundamental difference um, as we tune the composition of the cation. I know it is advantageous for other reasons, uh, so, so I don't think that will change. But you, your work um, rather elegantly brings into play uh, that we have to look at, um, at, at as we had to operating devices at higher brightnesses and mm. under, um, say under concentration, uh, the non radiative decay of electrons and holes through Auger yeah. processes be becomes quite important. And I think you've shown that mm. that can be important. In general, in most semiconductors, the, one of the key requirements is to actually be able to dope the material effectively. Uh, but in perovskite, it seems to be kind of difficult to actually control doping. So I wonder if you had tried uh, any experiments on that and if you have some conclusions about it. The, the, the interesting thing about the perovskites is that they break just about every rule um, and they work very well. They're much cleaner than they should be. They're very, very hard to dope and most semiconductor technologies have depended on the ability to extrinsically p-type or n-type mm. dope. That's often critically important for getting a really good quality ohmic yes. electrode. For organic semiconductors, as doping has been engineered after a few decades of hard work and is alive and well in you know, the OLEDs in yeah. uh, OLED displays. For the perovskites, it may well be that the ability of the materials of the perovskite material to adjust itself locally to neutralize the effect of a defect, which we suspect is why they are so luminescent and so clean, will also mean that you can't dope them. Yeah. That if you try to put a wrong valence cation in, the local chemistry will adjust itself 
and you won't create the doping. And the literature really suggests that may well be the case. And we've done a lot of work putting in monovalent cations that in principle might substitute for the lead. If anything, those materials, rather than being extrinsically doped, are even less doped than the materials um, by themselves. The literature that also tests that is looking for an electric field-induced charging in the material in a field effect device, a field effect transistor. And that literature is relatively small when it is possible to see a field effect. What we're not sure about is whether that field effect eventually is reduced because the induced charges um, can be compensated by structural mm -hmm. rearrangement around the charge. Again, it's been very surprising that the perovskites seem to show relatively good electrode behavior against, well, rather straightforwardly selected off-the-shelf mm -hmm. whole or electron extracting materials. Ultimately, they might not be as good as we need, um, but the reality is that almost anything works to a degree. Yeah, it's really interesting that the same process that prevents doping also allows you to not need doping. I think that's the case, yes. Yeah. I, I'm not, I haven't seen a lot of explicit discussion of that in the literature, but I think that's the case. Okay, well, thank you very much, Richard. Hey, Lewis, well, it's, it's great to see you back in Cambridge and, <laughs> uh, and good to chat. Yes. In the following section, Dr. Mejd Alsari and Dr. Mojdaba Abdi Jalabi talk about interdigitated back contact solar cells. So the common perovskite solar cell architecture is uh, normally represented by either a mesoscopic or a planar heterojunction. We have a perovskite film as the intrinsic semiconductor absorber layer, which is a sandwich between two transport materials. One is for electrons, called electron transport layer, and the other is for hole, uh, which is like the hole transport material. On the other hand, the market leading technology, crystalline silicon, the main architecture for this technology is interdigitated back contact solar cell. Mejd, can you explain bits about this IBC architecture? In the IBC architecture, we have the electron and hole selective uh, electrodes uh, co-positioned on the back side of the cell in an interdigitated fashion. And the IBC solar cell is completed by depositing the active layer on the interdigitated electrodes. With this architecture, optical transmission losses caused by the top co contact can be avoided by uh, bottom illumination, by illuminating the solar cell from the absorber layer side. And with this architecture, because electrodes transparency is not required, a wide variety of materials can be employed without compromising uh, conductivity. In addition, uh, these architectures offer the possibility to maintain the interconnection circuitry on the rear side of the cells on one common surface, facilitating solar cell module assembly processes. Uh, the IBC concept was originally developed for concentrating photovoltaics by Schwartz and Lammert in 1975 and has been successfully utilized in silicon-based, cadmium telluride, disensitized organic, and most recently perovskite solar cells. So what has been done so far with IBC perovskite solar cells? So there have been a few reports on IBC solar cells employing perovskites. Some reports focused on device optimization and others focused on the device physics of perovskite materials. However, the fabrication of these uh, devices involve uh, rather complicated steps, which is uh, a major issue for large-scale production. Can you talk about how the IBC architecture was used in our recent publication? So in our two recent studies, we used the IBC perovskite structure to investigate the charge dynamics and as well as to investigate the correlations between the structural and optoelectrical properties of the solar cells during film formation. And uh, in these two studies, we use a simple IBC structure. For the second study, 
we used a structure where we have commercially available interdigitated ITO substrates. We also use electro-deposited titanium dioxide, electro-polymerized PDOT, and spin-coated perovskite. One of the advantages of using this uh, architecture is the fact that the perovskite deposition represents the last fabrication step. And because the absorber layer is not blocked by any other layer, it can be directly probed um, during solar cell operation. And that can be coupled with many characterization techniques uh, such as uh, X-ray diffraction, photocurrent um, and photoluminescence mapping, um, and others. Can you talk in more detail about the work uh, that has been done at the SRF? So in this work, we used these IBC structures to investigate the structural and photovoltaic properties of perovskite solar cells um, during the anneal. So after fabricating these perovskite back contact uh, devices here in Cambridge, uh, I went to Grenoble to the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility, the ESRF, and um, we used these structures to investigate the relationship between the structural properties and the device performance of perovskite solar cells uh, during the during film formation during the perovskite uh, formation so we found that the precursor phase displays clean semiconducting behavior and we also saw that the voc peaks before the precursor fully converts into perovskite and that is probably due to a favorable combination between the band gaps of the precursor and the perovskite phase. We, we also found analogous trends between the perovskite peak intensity, which was extracted from GWAX measurements, with the power conversion efficiency. We were able to confirm these trends by observing similar profiles for planner devices. With these IBC devices, we were able to simultaneously measure the structural properties and the photovoltaic properties of perovskite solar cells during the formation of the perovskite. And that wouldn't have been possible without the IBC structure. In the following section, Dr. Felix Deschler and Dr. Luis Pazos discuss photon recycling in perovskite materials. So Felix, uh, nice to see you again. Nice to see you, Luis. Tell me something about like photon recycling these things. Can you explain some of the basic concepts behind it, like in the perovskite specifically? Yeah. Can you describe how the phenomenon occurs? When we studied the photoluminescence in these metal halide perovskites initially, we found that they are very bright materials and that also the luminescence overlaps quite a lot with the absorption edge of these materials. And so with this combination of, of factors, you could try and see this photon recycling effect where you generate charged pairs by absorbing um, a photon in the material. Um, and then the recombination of this charged pair generates another photon in the material that um, doesn't outcouple directly, doesn't leave the material directly, but gets reabsorbed and then generates another electron hole pair. And by this sequence of processes, you get this photon recycling effect. And when we when we try to see this together in our paper, um, we use this photoluminescence microscopy to look at the transport of charges and photons in the material. And we found that the transport occurs over length scales that are much beyond the expected length scales from just absorption. And, we were really excited to see that and um, concluded that photon recycling has to happen in this case. Um, it was super exciting to see this effect because it's so relevant for devices, right? But the key to actually get efficient photon recycling to, for this effect to be relevant, you need to have a very internal, uh, very high internal luminescence efficiency, right? That would mean that you know you need to have a very accurate measurement of the recombination rates. You need to know how much is going into radiation, how much is going into shock root hole. And well, you've done quite a lot of work on that. So can you tell us a little bit of how you've done those measurements, what the conclusions are? So in order to, to really record the recombination process of excited charge carriers, electrons mm -hmm. and holes in the perovskite, we use this ultra-fast laser spectroscopy techniques to study what happens when we use 
femtosecond pulses to put a certain number of carriers into the material mm -hmm. and how do they then relax to equilibrium conditions in the yeah. dark. These femtosecond pulses that we use are, are generated in, in large laser systems, so-called amplifiers, uh, for which this year the Nobel Prize was awarded. Yeah. It's very nice to hear that this is a useful technique now for us as well. And um, what we do is we, we, we excite the material with uh, short pulses. Um, we use a technique called pump probe spectroscopy where we measure the absorption of light through the material. If we have excited states in the material, we get a little bit more light through the perovskites. Yeah, if there are a lot of electrons in the material, you get more light through it. And then you can see how the, the amount of light going through it changes over time. Exactly. That's what you do. And that's what we can use to, to quantify how many charge carriers there are. And at the same time, we can measure the luminescence that we get out from these carriers. And this tells us all the information we really need to know um, mm -hmm. how the recombination works. And that was especially relevant for this, this photon recycling and photoluminescence yields, because when we did our measurements, it didn't agree with the quantum yields we measured externally. Exactly. And so we realized some other process has to happen, and that allowed us then to quantify really the amount of photon recycling that occurs mm -hmm. in the material. In this section, we illustrate the protocol for the fabrication of IBC perovskite solar cells discussed in our publications. In our work on photon recycling, we patterned the ITO substrates in our lab due to the unavailability of commercial 4 micron gap interdigitated ITO substrates. This was time consuming and involved photolithography. In our recent paper, we demonstrate that 100 micron gap substrates work as well as the 4 micron gap substrates when employed in the fabrication of solar cells. Electron and hole selective layers of titanium dioxide and PDOT were respectively electro deposited and electro polymerized on the interdigitated ITO electrodes. We used interdigitated ITO substrates with variable gaps ranging from 50 to 200 microns. The substrates need to be cleaned before use. Place the substrates on a substrate holder and immerse it in a beaker filled with acetone. Place the beaker in a sonicator filled with water and sonicate for 10 minutes. Transfer the substrate holder to another beaker containing isopropanol and sonicate again for 10 minutes. Finally, dry the substrates with nitrogen stream. We cathodically electrodeposit titanium dioxide from an aqueous peroxotitanium solution. Place a 25 milliliter glass beaker under a retort stand. Connect a 5 cm silver wire to a small crocodile clip. Connect the clip to a long aluminium wire and mount this on the stand. This is the reference electrode. Repeat these steps for a platinum foil, which is the counter electrode. Connect one side of the substrate to electrical connection legs for ITO glass substrates. Then bend the leg so that it fits in the beaker and wrap it with parafilm. Mount the ITO substrate on the retort stand. This is the working electrode. Connect the three electrodes to the galvanostat. Turn on the Autolab galvanostat and open the GPES software. Go to Method, Chrono Methods, and Perometry. In the manual control pop up, select a current range of 1 mA. Type a potential of minus 1.05 volts, a duration of 800 seconds, and a sampling time of 0.05 seconds. Pour 20 milliliters of deionized water into a 50 milliliter centrifuge tube. Weigh 64 milligrams of titanium oxysulfate salt with precision scales and transfer it to the centrifuge tube. Add 366 microliters of hydrogen peroxide to the centrifuge tube. Mix the solution with a centrifuge. 
weigh 202 mg of potassium nitrate and transfer it to the centrifuge tube. Mix the solution again. Finally, pour the solution into the beaker. In the Galvanostat control software, press Start. During the deposition, monitor current versus time. This gives an indication of how good the deposition is. If the curve is flat, there won't be any deposition taking place. Once the deposition is completed, rinse the substrate with water and ethanol, then dry it with nitrogen stream. Inspect the substrate and make sure the deposited titanium dioxide is uniform across the substrate. Anneal the substrate at 300 degrees for one hour under ambient conditions. We deposited PDOT through electropolymerization. After cleaning the silver and platinum electrodes, place them back to the previous configuration in a clean beaker. Connect the other side of the ITO substrate to a new electrical connection leg. Go to Methods, Chrono Methods, and Parometry and type a potential of 1.25 volts, a duration of 1 second, and a sampling time of 10 milliseconds. Pour 20 milliliters of propylene carbonate into a 50 milliliter glass vial. Weigh 2.12 grams of lithium perchlorate and transfer it into the vial. Sonicate the vial with the sonicator for 30 minutes. Add 21.4 microliters of EDOT. Close the vial and shake it. Pour the solution into the beaker. In the Galvanostat control software, press Start. During the deposition, monitor current versus time. After completion, rinse the substrate with acetonitrile and dry it with nitrogen stream. The precursor solution was spin-coated at 6,000 RPM for 30 seconds under ambient conditions. Turn on the solar simulator and let it warm up. Set the irradiance to one sun. Connect the IBC solar cell electrodes corresponding to the 100 micron gap to the multimeter using electrical connection legs. Set the following sweep parameters. Sweep range from minus 0.2 volts to 1 volt. Voltage step 10 millivolts, 50 milliseconds delay, and an active area of 0.0396 square centimeter. The solar cell measured here was fabricated at the Exmus beamline and had been stored under dark ambient conditions for almost two years. Interestingly, the device still works and shows a relatively high open circuit voltage. A common aspect of all JV curves reported in our works is that the fill factor is very low and that the JV curves are straight lines. This is likely to be caused by a high series resistance. More selective interlayers and optimized electrode deposition could improve the efficiency of these IBC solar cells. In the last part of this work, Dr. Felix Deschler and Dr. Luis Pazos discuss the future developments of IBC perovskite solar cells at the University of Cambridge. You actually have a project now on the back contact solar cells, right? Yeah, we're working. Because there is an interesting aspect of it that you mentioned earlier that in these kind of solar cells, you actually have all of the electrons in the back. Therefore, you can actually tune the top surface in whichever way you find. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting structure where we basically take our vertical device and we flip it over 90 degrees and try to make all the electrodes in plane. That helps us to make the solar cell more transparent because we can minimize the area of the reflective electrodes. Potentially, they could be quite good for applications in windows or wherever you want to transmit some light through your solar cell. Uh, additionally, it gives us access to the surface of the perovskite film, which is usually the most defective area. And you mentioned non-radiative mm -hmm. decays, which are the main loss for luminescence. So now we have a, uh, a surface that we can address and where we can use chemical passivation, um, other fabrication techniques to reduce the number of defects that we have on this dominant surface um, and area of the perovskite films. 
Yeah, you can use passivation, passivation agents that are not even conducted, right? Exactly. They can be insulators, you don't care. Exactly, we don't need to care about extracting charges from this interface, which usually in the vertical devices is, is the largest interface where you mm -hmm. need to get charges through. Um, and so we tried already a few approaches and it, it seems as if we can efficiently passivate these films very well and get very high luminescence yields in them. And now we are trying to combine this all and make one big full structure and um, then try with um, photonic structures on top to, to modulate the photon density internally so that we can boost uh, the photon recycling effects. Um, particularly something that is really nice about the back context is that the surface structure doesn't have to be functional, so we don't have to put a structured electrode on top. We can just put some non-conductive dielectric stack on top that has a photonic band gap in the right um, energy range. And then hopefully we will improve the efficiency of the devices. Okay, well, thank you very much for all these explanations. Thank you, Lewis. Hope to see you soon. Good job. See you soon.